Welcome to Enabling Motion, the podcast where we bring you the inspiring technology that keeps people moving. Welcome back, especially after our first episode two weeks ago. It's been amazing to hear all the great feedback from everyone. Right, guys? Absolutely. And I just want to say how excited we are to be getting the second episode out. Um, Some of the great comments that we've been receiving talking about whose topics were the favorite from from our last episode yeah it's been really fun to see we've been having a little bit of a competition between us to see who can come up with the best one for this episode so we'll be excited to see what you guys think yes thank you so much for tuning in to our very first episode and we hope that you enjoy this one as well Uh, so what are you going to be talking about today yeah, thanks. Uh, so my topic this week is a exoskeleton device specifically for actually people who have prosthetic legs. Mark? Very cool. I am going to be sharing a new type of therapy for those who have suffered from stroke that is incorporating in interactive and adaptable music. Stay tuned and you'll see what that means. Owen, what about you? I'll be talking about a project coming out of the University of Victoria that's helping developing countries have access to prosthetic hands. Amazing. University of Victoria, near and dear to my heart. I heard about this project while I was there. Was never involved, but it actually was part of my inspiration for getting into the field that I'm in. So I'm very excited to hear what you got on it. And if you're interested in what we have to say about our topics today, we hope that you can tune in to this little ad break to help with rent this month. Welcome back. So prosthetic legs are amazing tools that return essential functionality to patients. However, standard ones are unable to replicate the biomechanics of biological legs. So above knee amputees have to exert a lot more energy to walk than double leg counterparts, which is further complicated by reduced muscle mass in the residual limb. A team from University of Utah's Bionic Engineering Lab has developed an exoskeleton device to assist with walking for such users. It's a unique combination of orthotics and prosthetics. The lightweight device wraps around the wearer's waist and thighs and uses battery-powered electric motors and microprocessors to provide additional force to the affected leg. This reduced the participant's energy consumption by an average of 15.6%. It's the equivalent of taking off a 12-kilogram backpack that you're carrying around all the time. More impressively, it brought their overall exertion very close to the average person's energy expenditure when walking at the same speed. And the reason why this is super important is that energy expenditure is one of the most important factors when assessing someone's capability when walking, making this a major advancement towards making ambulation less taxing for amputees. The device itself only weighs two kilograms and is very close to the center of mass, aiding stability. Following a nearly $1 million grant from the U.S. government, which is a big indicator of success, a commercial version of the device could be released within the next couple of years. So I think that's really exciting because it's one of the most interesting combinations of orthotics and prosthetics that I've ever heard about. That is such an interesting combination of both of those fields of now using a powered orthotic essentially to then help out someone who is using a prosthetic. I think that's a really cool combination. That is really cool. And you don't hear about those worlds kind of crossing over very much. No, and not really. Hearing you talk about this, it makes a ton of sense. It if does. You want to maximize sort of the biomechanical effectiveness of a prosthetic device. Right. Implementing something like this is is brilliant. Right. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting that we just, you know, our courses, um, we were just talking about, you know, energy expenditure while walking so recently. So I think that's super interesting uh, that it was such a recent overlap. And one of the questions that 
I really had, and I couldn't find much information on was that what about powered knee prosthetics? Because at least on the University of Utah's page, they were showing that some of the participants had powered knees. And so I think that this means that even with powered knees, they're still able to help people there. And the idea that you're able to get it to so close to an original biological limb is insane. That's amazing. That I mean, that's like the holy grail of, of prosthetics. So I, I, I'm just, I'm amazed by this. The prospects are very exciting. Right. I agree with you there. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Mark, I think uh, you had something really exciting as well today. I do. Okay. So did you guys know that the humpback whale songs can actually create a type of culture that then spread across the ocean and have actually started to develop their own type of genre. What? No way. Very cool. So, of course, today I'm going to be talking about music and how music is being used to deliver therapy to those who have suffered from stroke. I'm going to be discussing a study coming out of the Alborg University in Copenhagen, where PhD fellow Prithvi Canton and his colleagues are developing a new technique for auditory biofeedback, where they use adaptive, synthesized music to assist with stroke rehab. Now, getting feedback to our brain from all parts of our body is crucial for normal learning and functioning. Our organs are constantly updating our brains about internal state information through both chemical and electrical info, which is the basic mechanism that regulates homeostasis. In terms of motor learning and regular motor functions, our muscles are constantly updating our brains on tension, contraction speed, and force so that we can be well informed about limb position and so that we can better plan movements. We can also use our vision to provide additional body position and movement info. We also regularly implement air feedback information to better optimize our motor skills. Our brains are always predicting the outcomes of our movements and comparing them with actual outcomes. This allows us to output more useful motor programs. Because biofeedback is so important for learning and regular function, developing useful biofeedback tools can be extremely useful in a rehab setting. Oftentimes, internal feedback mechanisms can be impaired, resulting in lower quality feedback. One interesting new feedback tool being auditory feedback, where limb position and movement is translated into sound. While music has been implemented in many forms of therapy as a means to energize and motivate, auditory feedback therapies have not gotten off the ground in the same way. One major reason being that the current methods lack depth and aren't entirely aesthetically pleasing. Usually just monotonal bells or alarms um, that don't really give that interactive feel. This is why I think Canton's work is so fascinating. They've managed to translate biomechanical data into music. The beauty being that the music is adaptive and can change in tone, pitch, tempo, instrument composition, all in response to positional changes of the body, functionally reinforcing a mind-body connection through an additional sensory modality. Now, take a listen to their device at work. What we're hearing right now as the pitch and the tempo increase is actually the knee extending. And as it goes back into flexion, we can hear the pitch drop back down. With the speed of the extension and flexion, we're hearing the tempo increase and decrease. Now, the setup that we just heard has two inertial motion sensors, one proximal and one distal to the knee. When the sensors detect relative movement, they send the information via Wi-Fi to the processing software, where the information is integrated into the musical output. The team also demonstrates this tech for postural control and correction, even adding distortion to the music if unwanted ranges of motion are reached. 
Now, take a look over Canton's paper for a more in-depth look into the specific schematics. If you're really interested in the software side of things, they have it outlined very nicely. And I think you'll find yourself wanting one of these devices to generate a soundtrack to your own life. Yeah, that, that really sounds like a, a tagline for a set of headphones. <laughs> Create yeah, a no, soundtrack for your own life. Yeah. yeah. Create a soundtrack yeah, for yeah. your own life. Yeah. Although that is kind of fun. Like um Spon- this this uh this segment sponsored by Raycon. Um <laughs> Skull Candy. Redacted. Um uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. The um so Mark, could you give us a slightly could you elaborate a little bit on how this would help rehabilitate someone with a stroke? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea essentially is, is that giving you something that can sort of map out your music, your movements Mm -hmm. in a very interactive way, right? Instead of just being told right or wrong with Mm -hmm. a, with a a buzzer or a, a little bell, gotcha, actually being immersed in the music Mm -hmm. It gives you a chance to get kind of synced up with it. And then the feedback that's happening is much more interactive. So you're not only aware of your motion if it's beyond the threshold of being unwanted Mm -hmm. or within the threshold of being wanted, you're more in tune with it the whole time. And so the important thing here was that mind-body connection. Mm You were now your movements where you were feedback mechanisms might be impaired and oftentimes in stroke rehabilitation you're needing to relearn how to do movements that you've been able to do your whole life or you know Mm -hmm. there's not simple but but movements that you have historically been quite familiar with where you are now needing to relearn and having that real-time interactive feedback Mm -hmm. is offers just a much higher more elevated form of of that feedback gotcha and it's multi-sensory in a way compared in a way yeah because you're not only looking at it visually or or just a simple tone you're you're now your rhythm your your systems that respond to music in the first place are being involved right you know it's really interesting i i had this really great lab class in undergrad um when i was studying biomed engineering where we would just do these really fun experiments. And one of them was uh, we put these EMG electrodes on and we played, we did push-ups with and without music. And we were just, it it was just, we, you could so clearly see that music had such a insane effect on your ability to do physical activity. Uh, Now, even for those of us who were not the most athletic Right. <laughs> Felt like it gave you a little bit of an extra boost. Oh, it definitely did. It definitely for did. sure. Yeah. Now that's a that's a loaded that's a loaded topic. So oh, we dear. won't speculate on the difference between it giving you that motivation or uh-huh. what it's doing here because uh-huh. that that we could go on and on and on about. Gotcha. Gotcha. But right. it is cool and it does speak to how interesting this approach is mm-hmm. and also the prospect of this being implemented um, into clinical settings. Very cool. Thanks for bringing that. Absolutely. All right. Now, Owen will be back right after this ad break. It is going to fund me paying for whale song cassettes. So it's quite important that you guys listen. Thank you so much. Wow, weren't those some great ads? Honestly, that's all I listen to podcasts for. Around the world, more than 3 million people have undergone upper limb amputations, and 80% of those people live in developing countries. What began as a research project at the University of Victoria in Canada is now a not-for-profit organization utilizing 3D printing technology to get low-cost prosthetics to those who need them. Currently, the project is providing 3D printed hands to eight developing countries around the world, as well as right here in Canada and the United States. So how do they do it? 
Firstly, they find a willing and able clinical partner in the developing country, such as the Agile Development Group in Cambodia or the Healing Hands for Haiti, to provide clinical resources while the Victoria Hand Project trains them on how to construct their hands. The next step is to set up a 3D print center within the country. Here, a technician will be able to scan the patient's residual limb and 3D model and print a custom socket for that patient. Throughout this process, the Victoria Hand Project provides training, technology, and technical support to ensure the patients get the highest quality of prosthetics as possible. The project is constantly working to redesign and improve their hand from feedback given by patients as well as their partners. And since everything is being 3D printed all at once, these changes can be implemented almost immediately. Truly, the Victoria Hand Project is utilizing 3D printing technology to its fullest on this global scale. If you'd like to learn more about the project or how you can get involved, please go to their website, victoriahandproject.com. It's amazing stuff, Owen. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have any idea how many arms they've given out by any chance? I believe that they were estimating over the past three years that about 200. Wow. Um, I believe that to date, it's about 170. Wow. Okay. That's that's yeah. significant. And it's all over the world. I think that's, it's such a cool use of not just like, I mean, 3D printing and then the internet, because you can, yeah. you can just say that, oh, hey, you know, like, Somewhere in Asia, we've encountered this sort of hiccup. And then the team over in Canada will be like, oh, we can change the design this way. And then they update the file and then they print it out in Asia again. They're like, oh, it's great now. And that's just, it's insane. Exactly. I I think this is amazing. Yeah. The level of global collaboration on this one is really, really cool. It's, It's amazing to see. I think a lot of the time we don't realize how difficult it is to get quality devices in in some of these places. And that I know is the sort of the the mission statement of the, the hand project was to get functional devices into the hands of of those that just didn't have access to it. And to see it to see it grow into what it has is really exciting. Yeah, the number like one of the hardest things about getting a prosthetic uh, in a developing country is how cost prohibitive prosthetics are, and this is the one of the cheapest methods of being able to make one for someone that's going to be not only comfortable but functional uh, and uh, as cheap as possible really yeah i mean you know a lot of my interest and background in prosthetics was coming from the background of i i mean i really like really advanced prosthetics but the question that started coming up was well how do you make them accessible for everyone so that's why i i got a 3d printer when i was based in pakistan and Unfortunately, I never got involved in printing out any prosthetics, but now that Mark has one, we can, all three of us can try and get, yeah, we, can start. we can start getting that going. Um, the George Brown the hand. The project. George Brown hand. Yeah, the P&O project. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, talking about our favorites uh, of the day. Uh, Sabelle, like, what was your favorite topic of Ooh, today? That's a hard one. I love my arms, man. I love my arms. Okay, but here's the thing. The music in that biofeedback, it's just so cool. The fact that it's it, cool, like, right? It's it's because it's not just like it's not just changing tone. It's like actual music that's being remixed. I don't know. It's it's real music coming out of there. That's that's epic. Um, it's being generated in real time and adapting to and being fed information about the the limb positions and then adjusting these. F- components of the music in real time yeah it makes me want that for walking around because think of what you're saying about working out with music and the motivation that it gives you imagine if it was tailored to your body yeah i'm 
cool yeah, that would be. Yeah, a whole workout where the music keeps just responding and kind of like every time you get a rep in, the music like rewards you by getting better. Yeah, it's that's cool insane. Idea. Um, so I'm going to have to go with that one just because of that little bit of a coolness factor. What about you, Owen? What, which one did you like? Yeah, my favorite, I think, uh, was actually your uh, talk. I think it's so cool to hear about that, uh, I, as we talked about before, that orthotics are starting to be utilized in prosthetic yeah. management as oh, well. Listeners, just to clarify, um, exoskeletons are technically powered orthotics, which is why we say orthotics, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm actually really intrigued and to how this stuff will go forward. I I'm wondering whether battery size is going to be the biggest limiter at this point for everything. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Because like motors have yeah. gotten so small, they, they do require. Power yeah, motors have gotten so small and powerful. So like, what's going to be the limiting factor mm-hmm. on everything? My guess is my guess is battery size, but it's just so epic, it's so epic battery size. And if you forget to charge your phone at night, you're gonna maybe forget to charge your. <laughs> orthotics dude i know i'm bad with that so yeah i there's this one um she's she's actually a paralympian and she was like joking about how she sometimes forgets to charge her knee powered knee. right that's funny (laughs) (laughs) and i was like yeah i mean i forget to charge my phone and you know i'll i'll miss meeting up with one of you for coffee Yeah. It's a whole other deal with her. Uh, but yeah, Mark, what was your favorite? So, of the day? I mean, I'm gonna every time I'm gonna ask if I can choose my own as my favorite. No, no, and I know I can. We've made that clear. <laughs> I'm always gonna ask. These are the rules. I'm set for always ourselves. gonna ask. But <laughs> this is not no. <laughs> uh, Victoria Ham Project. When we do this, <laughs> Victoria Ham Project. Uh, near alma and dear, mater. Alma mater. Because I exactly I heard about it in my undergrad yeah. and wasn't sure what I was doing with my life. And so I never, I was never involved with it, but I watched as it progressed and heard about it and it did, it sparked this interest. And Mm. I absolutely attribute some of my motivation to be doing what I'm doing now to what they were doing there and the importance of providing accessible, um, affordable devices in this field, I think is so important. Even in North America, mm. the expense that people have to take on is is insane. And so one of my huge goals is to always be able to find ways to make things affordable and attainable. And so what they're doing, I just, I, I stand so strongly behind. So that's my favorite. Absolutely. Nice. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. That was a great episode. Please let us know your favorite topic from today. Uh, message us on our Instagram. It's at enabling motion pod on Instagram. Let us know if any other cool topics that you know about and we'll include them in another episode. We'll be back in two weeks from now, wherever podcasts are found and check out our YouTube. Looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Thanks. Take care.